Hey everybody, this is Deb with Truthfication Chronicles, and I found this letter that I thought you might find interesting. And it's from Emmett T. Flood, who is the special counsel to the president. And it came out on April 19th. Now, if I remember correctly, I think the Mueller report came out officially on the 18th, if my mind hasn't gone all glitchy on me on that. But I'm pretty sure it came out on the 18th. So the 19th was the day after it came out. And this was hand-delivered to Barr by the president's special counsel. So let's see what he had to say. I think it's kind of interesting. Dear Mr. Attorney General, I write on behalf of the Office of the President to memorialize concerns relating to the form of the special counsel's office report and to address executive privilege issues associated with its release. Now I'm going to, you know, it's going to say SCO and that will be the special counsel's office and SCO report or just report and it's referring to the Mueller report, okay? The SCO report suffers from an extraordinary legal defect. It quite deliberately fails to comply with the requirements of governing law. Lest the report's release be taken as a precedent or perceived as somehow legitimating the defect, I write with both the president and future presidents in mind to make the following points clear. I begin with the SEO's stated conclusion on the obstruction question. The SEO concluded that the evidence prevented it from conclusively determining that no criminal conduct occurred. SEO report, volume 2, page 2. But conclusively determining that no criminal conduct occurred was not the SEO's assigned task. Because making conclusive determinations of innocence is never the task of the federal prosecutor. What prosecutors are supposed to do is complete an investigation and then either ask the grand jury to return an indictment or decline to charge the case. When prosecutors decline to charge, they make that decision not because they have conclusively determined that no criminal conduct occurred, but rather because they do not believe that the investigated conduct constitutes a crime for which all the elements can be proven to the satisfaction of a jury beyond a reasonable doubt. Prosecutors simply are not in the business of establishing innocence any more than they are in the business of exonerating investigated persons. In the American justice system, innocence is presumed. There is never any need for prosecutors to conclusively determine it nor is there any place for such a determination. Our country would be a very different and very dangerous place if prosecutors applied the SCO standard and citizens were obliged to prove conclusively that no criminal conduct occurred. Because they do not belong to our criminal justice vocabulary, the SCO's inverted proof standard and the exoneration statements can be understood only as political statements issuing from persons, federal prosecutors, who in our system of government are rightly expected never to be political in the performance of their duties. The inverted burden of proof knowingly embedded in the SCO's conclusion shows that the special counsel and his staff failed in their duty to act as prosecutors and only as prosecutors. It shows the bias, that's for sure. Second and equally importantly, in closing its investigation, the SEO had only one job, to provide the Attorney General with a confidential report explaining the prosecution or declination decisions reached by the special counsel. And there's the code for it. Yet, the one thing the SEO was obligated to do is the very thing the SEO intentionally and unapologetically refused to do. The SCO made neither a prosecution decision nor a declination decision on the obstruction question. Instead, it transmitted a 182-page discussion of raw evidentiary material combined with its own inconclusive observations on the arguable legal significance of the gathered content. As a result, none of the reports, Volume 2, complied with the obligation imposed by the governing regulation to explain the prosecution or declination decisions reached. The SEO instead produced a prosecutorial 
curiosity, part truth commission report, and part law school exam paper, far more detailed than the text of any known criminal indictment or declination memorandum, the report is laden with factual information that has never been subjected to an adversarial testing or independent analysis. You see, they not put out there like a court case where the, you know, your attorney can argue against it, but that was not, you know, able to be done with this. It was all from one perspective only which is a real problem, and that's one reason why they typically don't include all of that stuff out there when they decide not to prosecute somebody on something. I mean, they have to draw a line at some point, and with that, you know, if they're not going to prosecute somebody, then those things can't come out in court and can't be argued. So it's not fair to put them out there because you don't know what the defense might be arguing against it. And they might make a very good case on their side. So that's one reason why they don't include it if they're going to decline prosecution. So that's not what happened in this volume too. You know, they didn't decline it so they could do this. And they should not have done this. This was not proper. And it didn't follow the legal format that they normally follow when they're doing either a criminal indictment or declination memorandum. And it says that information is accompanied by a series of inexplicably inconclusive observations. Inexplicable, that is, coming from a prosecutor. Concerning possible applications of law to fact, this species of public report has no basis in the relevant regulation and no precedent in the history of special or independent counsel investigations. An investigation of the president under a regulation that clearly specifies a very particular form of closing documentation is not the place for indulging creative departures from governing law. Under general prosecutorial principles and under the special counsel regulations specific language, prosecutors are to speak publicly through indictments or confidentially in declination memorandum. You see, this was the deal here. If they were going to indict somebody, then that is public because the indictment is put out there publicly. If they are going to decline, then they shouldn't be putting things out there in public. And that's the whole point of it, that they really should not have put as much material in there as they did. The report was a lot longer than it should have been. By way of justifying this departure, it has been suggested that the report was written with the intent of providing Congress some kind of roadmap for congressional action. And it says, see the remarks of House Judiciary Committee Chairman Gerald Nadler for 1819 at a press conference. And if you look down here, it says, some commentators have pointed to the so-called Watergate Roadmap as precedent for giving Congress a prosecutor's report containing no legal conclusions. That roadmap is shrouded in a bodyguard of myths and the many separation of powers problems presented by its transmission remain largely unexplored. But the idea that it was a straightforward, just the facts type summary is easily dispelled. As two top Watergate prosecutors wrote years after the events of 1973 and 74, the Watergate task force created the roadmap to serve as a do-it-yourself kit for the Judiciary Committee, helping it reassemble the individual pieces of grand jury testimony and other evidence, and then look at this, into a coherent theory of a criminal case, as we in the grand jury saw it. So at that point, they had seen it as a criminal case that they were building against Nixon. And so that is something very important to take note of. Anyway, it goes back here. If that was in fact the SCO's intention, it too serves as additional evidence of the SCO's refusal to follow applicable law. Both the language of the regulation and its legislative history make plain that the closing documentation language was promulgated for the specific purpose of preventing the creation of this sort of final report. And then it has a footnote down here too. 
At the time of the special counsel's regulation creation in 1999, it was widely understood that Section 600.8c was not intended to provide for a report which discusses the evidence at length, much less its public dissemination. And so there's the information on that. So back up here. Under a constitution of separated powers, inferior Article II officers, and Article II is all about the executive branch, and so that would be Mueller and his people, should not be in the business of creating roadmaps for the purpose of transmitting them to Article I committees, and Article I would be the legislative branch. That's of the Constitution. With the release of the SCO report, and despite all of the foregoing, the President has followed through on his consistent promise of transparency. He encouraged every White House staffer to cooperate fully with the SCO, and, so far as we are aware, all have done so. Voluntary interviewees included the counsel to the President, two chiefs of staff, the press secretary, and numerous others. In addition, approximately 1.4 million pages of documents were provided to the SCO. This voluntary cooperation was given on the understanding reached with the SCO that information, one, gathered directly from the White House or White House staffers, and two, having to do with presidential communications, White House deliberations, law enforcement information, and perhaps other matter may be subject to a potential claim of executive privilege and, for that reason, would be treated by the SCO as presumptively privileged. Volume 2 of the report contains a great deal of presumptively privileged information, largely in the form of references to and descriptions of White House staff interviews with the SCO. It also includes reference to presumptively privileged documentary materials. The President is aware that, had he chosen to do so, he could have withheld such information on executive privilege grounds, basing such an assertion on the established principle that, to permit release of such information, might have a chilling effect on a president's advisors, causing them to be less than fully frank in providing advice to a president. Notwithstanding his right to assert such a privilege, and with a full measure of reluctance born of concern for future presidents and their advisors, the president has in this instance elected not to assert executive privilege over any of the presumptively privileged portions of the report. As a consequence, not a single redaction in the report was done on the advice of or at the direction of the White House. The President therefore wants the following features of his decision to be known and understood. 1. His decision not to assert privilege is not a waiver of executive privilege for any other material or for any other purpose. 2. His decision to permit disclosure of executive privilege portions of the report does not waive any privileges or protections for the SCO's underlying investigative materials such as, for example, FBI Form 302 witness interview summaries and presumptively privileged information made available to the SCO by the White House. And three, his decision does not affect his ability as president to instruct his advisors to decline to appear before congressional committees to answer questions on these same subjects. It is one thing for a president to encourage complete cooperation and transparency in a criminal investigation conducted largely within the executive branch. It is something else entirely to allow his advisors to appear before Congress, a coordinate branch of government, and answer questions related to their communications with the president and with each other. The former course reflected the president's recognition of the importance of promoting cooperation with a criminal investigation. The latter course creates profound separation of powers concerns and, if not defended aggressively, threatens to undermine the integrity of executive branch deliberations. The president is determined to protect from congressional scrutiny not only the advice rendered by his own advisors, but also by advisors to future presidents. And so he was reserving that right, and you will notice probably from here on out, the gloves are off. We've transitioned into a new phase of all of this, where the Mueller report is out, we found out no collusion, and the president is stepping back to center stage. And from now on, when they start trying to get 
all of these people and to catch them on things, they're going to start saying no. You saw it with Barr. He didn't go to the House Judiciary because it was a trap. Plain and simple. It was a trap set up for him. And he wasn't going to have any part of it. And so, you know, he didn't go. The only reason he probably went to the Senate is because Lindsey Graham was in charge. And so they did have, you know, the Republicans were able to curtail some of the antics. And, you know, when Maisie Hirono got out of line, Lindsey Graham reeled her in. He should have probably done it a little sooner, I would have thought. You know, there needs to be some kind of rule, I think, about calling people names and, and things like she did to him, to Barr. And she also really was very disrespectful to the office of the president. Whether you like the guy or you don't, they shouldn't be allowed to call the president names. And it, it just shouldn't happen, not in the committee hearings. And if they want to call them names, you know, on their own when they're out doing something, that's up to them. But when they're involved in the business of running our country, there should be a respect for the office, no matter who's in it. Okay. And that's, you know, my opinion on that one. A great deal is said these days about the rule of law and the importance of legal norms. In that spirit, and mindful of the frenzied atmosphere accompanying the report's release, the following should not be forgotten. Government officials with access to classified information derived from a counterintelligence investigation and from classified intelligence intercepts engaged in a campaign of illegal leaks against the president. I like how he's pointing this out here. Many of those leaks were felonies. And so I think this is kind of giving us a heads up that there will be some felony charges against these people who did the leaking. Because that was one of the things Sessions was doing. He was setting up traps to catch leakers. And we know that for sure because of the James Wolf incident where he leaked the Carter Page FISA warrant, but he leaked a version that had some subtle changes in it. And that is how they caught him because they knew for sure he was the one leaking it. So yeah, very clever. And I think there was a lot more of that going on, but we just haven't seen those arrests yet. So going on, they disclosed the identity of a U.S. person in violation of his civil rights. They misused intelligence for partisan political purposes, and they eroded public confidence in the integrity and impartiality of our intelligence services. The criminal investigation began with a breach of confidentiality executed by a very senior administration official who was himself an intelligence service chief. This leak of confidential information, personally directed by the former director of the FBI, triggered the creation of the SCO itself, precisely as he intended it to do. And if you haven't seen it, I have a video on this forgotten felony, because the leak of the unmasking and then the leak of Mike Flynn's name, that was a felony. Someone needs to be held accountable for that. I'm hoping that they will find out who it is or they already know who it is and that that person will be held accountable because those kinds of leaks are felonies and they do need to be prosecuted. So anyway, going on, not so long ago, the idea that a law enforcement official might provide the press with confidential government information for the proclaimed purpose of prompting a criminal investigation of an identified individual would have troubled Americans of all political persuasions. And that's exactly what happened. Comey purposely leaked the information so that they would be able to start this whole special counsel thing. And he clearly said that was the reason he did it. So we know that for sure. You know, and it should have been troubling people. Why isn't it troubling more people is the question. That the head of our country's top law enforcement agency has actually done so to the President of the United States should frighten every friend of individual liberty. Under our system of government, unelected executive branch officers and intelligence agency personnel are supposed to answer to the person elected by the people, the President, and not the other way around. This is not a Democratic or a Republican issue. It is a matter of having a government responsible to the people, and again, not the other way around. 
In the partisan commotion surrounding the released report, it would be well to remember that what can be done to a president can be done to any of us. And I think that's a key that we have to remember, especially when you think about all the queries that they did. They did all these illegal queries from the NSA database. And that's what Admiral Mike Rogers discovered because he was the director of the NSA and he was not signing off on these queries, but somebody else was. And the only other person that could have done it was Loretta Lynch. He started digging into it and he found out that there was more than that going on and that they actually had independent contractors who were searching the NSA database. They were getting information on anyone who was a political foe for the Democrats. So, you know, I'm sure that a lot of people were on that list and they had the basic information so that they could use it against them. So anyway, it goes on. These leaks and this investigation also caused immense and continuing interference with the functioning of the executive branch. Our Constitution makes the president the sole constitutional officer for whom the entire nation votes and who represents the entire nation both domestically and abroad. As a result, interference with the president's ability to carry out his public responsibilities is constitutionally equivalent to interference with the ability of the entirety of Congress or the judicial branch to carry out its public obligations. It is inarguable that the now resolved allegation of Russian collusion placed a cloud over the president that has only begun to lift in recent weeks. And especially since, remember, Mueller knew about the no collusion over a year ago. I mean, a long time ago, he found out that there was no collusion. And this has all been a charade ever since then. The pendency of the SCO investigation plainly interfered with the president's ability to carry out his public responsibility to serve the American people and to govern effectively. These very public and widely felt consequences flowed from and were fueled by improper disclosures by senior government officials with access to classified information. That this continues to go largely unremarked should worry all civil libertarians, all supporters of investigative due process, and all believers in limited and effective government under the Constitution. I respectfully ask you to include a copy of this letter in the department's records relating to the SCO investigation. And one of the main reasons, as he said, that he put this out here is because they needed to make sure this wasn't going to be set down as a precedent for what happens next. The law works very heavily on a precedent, what's gone before. And if they set this down and it goes unchallenged, then it'll be easier later on for them to question it and to come back and say, well, you know, they did it here. So surely that should still be something we can do. And who knows what the future might hold for another president. And we have to make sure that this is not allowed to happen again to any president because what has happened here has just been a travesty of justice. So that's the letter I wanted to point out to you. I really thought that it was kind of interesting that Barr got this. I think Barr is going to do what's right and that he is tenacious enough that he will take these people on. I watched him in the Senate hearing and his face was like stony most of the time, even when they were saying really nasty stuff about him and questioning his integrity, calling him a perjurer and everything. This is crazy. The Democrats are going off the deep end. And why? Because the truth is coming out. And when the truth comes out completely, most of these people will end up being indicted. So they're trying their best. This is their last gasp effort. They're running out of ammunition, though. They've been tested so many times, they just don't have much left. And so they're trying anything. And that's the reason why we have Kentucky Fried Chicken and little chicken statues. Yeah, they're that desperate. And I don't know if you watched that hearing. Technically, the hearing itself was like, five minutes, I think, because all it was was Nadler coming out and saying they Barr hadn't shown up. And then he gave his five minute, you know, little spiel. And then he started to close and somebody raised one of the Republicans raised a point of order. 
and he ignored them totally and closed the entire thing. So it was like he didn't even allow the Republicans to make any comments whatsoever. And that was it because it has become a big show thing. And they're hoping their constituents aren't going to look past what they're doing. And they're going to say, well, see, that bar didn't show up and he should have shown up. And Yeah, no, he shouldn't have shown up. I'm glad he didn't. It shows me that he has a lot of spine. And that's exactly what we need right now in his position, because it's going to take a lot of spine to do these investigations. And that's what's making the Democrats so crazy, because they can't afford to have these investigations go on because Barr's going to get to the bottom of this whole thing and how it all started and that they had nothing. It all started because they needed to stop Trump. And this was their plan to stop him. You know, putting the dossier out there didn't work to stop him from winning. He won. They lost their power. And they knew as soon as they lost their power, they were going to be in trouble because they never thought Hillary would lose. And even she was quoted as saying that if he won, then they would all hang. So it's a very interesting situation that's going to be unveiled soon. We're seeing little bits and pieces of it come out, but it's coming faster, you know, and it's not going to be long before everything is out. And the American people know exactly what these unelected officials did. And some of them were elected officials, actually, which we'll find out later. But I think we're going to have to start with some of these unelected officials first, and then it'll build its way up because we are seeing the truth come out. Even the New York Times had an article about it and called it spying in the Trump campaign. So that's a step in the right direction. But anyway, I wanted to share this with you and I hope you found it interesting. I like finding these little tidbits that open my eyes to things. I mean, this helps put the whole Mueller report in perspective from Trump's point of view, really. And I think he did a good job of laying it out there and saying, you did not follow the procedure that you were supposed to follow. You were supposed to put a report out that was done from a prosecutor's point of view. And you were supposed to basically either indict or decline. And when you didn't do either of those, if it's not an indictment and it's not a declination memorandum, then you really shouldn't have been putting all this evidence and everything out there. And you had no business putting out volume two that said, well, we couldn't decide. You know, that's not your position. If there's not enough evidence and you don't think there's enough evidence, you have to say declined. That's all there is to it. I mean, that's a job of these federal prosecutors. If there's not enough evidence for probable cause, you cannot prosecute. And so you have to decline. And so that's it for today. I want to thank you for stopping by and I'll see you all later. Bye.